Okay, now finishing up the rest of this Lizardman army. Now that I've confirmed everything here is kosher, we've got Saurus Warriors with shields, four of them up front, and then we're also going to have four Chameleon Skinks for that skirmishing potential. Now over here on the left, left flank, it looks like we have the monsters and the leadership squad kind of stacked. We're going to have the Umbral Tide Salamander Hunting Pack, the Legion of Shakwa Saurus Spears. We're also going to be looking here at Gorok and a Skink Priest of Beast. The Skink Priest of Beast is going to be bringing excuse me, uh, Manticore Summon and Flock of Doom, and Gorok is going to be bringing things that I don't know the name of because I don't see him super often, and we got the Shield of Aeons and Rock of Itza. No seeing that rock because he's just that hardcore. Alright, so the battle is getting started. Necrofex Colossus making some opening shots. And it looks like the Vampire Coast leadership is going to kind of be pushing up there with the Necrofex Colossus. <clears throat> Trying to work with it to get some value as the Lizardmen close the gap. Lizardmen do have a very wide army. You can see that as far as troop counts go, they're pretty much evenly matched. Um, the coast going to be really far back in their deployment, just kind of waiting in the forest, hiding a lot of their units so the Lizardman doesn't know what they're going into. But then, you know, arguably more importantly, it's going to be giving the Vampire Coast a lot of time to just fire and retreat, fire and retreat um, repeatedly with their hero squad, with their pistols, and uh, of course the Necrovex Colossus here with its carronade arm. Already about a third of the half off health off of those Saurus Warriors. And we'll see if the Colossus is going to change of targets anytime soon. Oh, no. He's still... He's got a... Vengeance, wants these guys dealt with the Vengeance. And there goes a Scab Scrap. And that's going to do a good amount of damage on top of the Skink Cohort. Million Skinks doing some good damage there. Very effective counter skirmishers, but we're going to see a zombie gunnery mob summon coming in here to help counter skirmish that. And you know, even if these guys lose, which they should pretty handedly against Million Skinks, it's a summon, so I would say it's a pretty economic way to draw out some fire from your opponent. Uh, maybe try to have them waste it on a less valuable target. Right now, it does look like the Necrofex Glosses and the Vampire Heroes are going to be pulling back. Uh, just sacrificing the zombie pirate gunnery mob while the rest of the important units pull out. And we will see. These chameleon skinks are fast and uh, they do a surprising amount of damage, especially when they gang up on a unit like the Necrofex Colossus. So, Salamander Hunting Pack, the Umbral Tide has now come in, and here comes a big volley of fireballs all hitting that Necrofex Colossus, and boom, that's a lot of damage being done there. Will the Umbral Tide get another volley off uh, is the question, and I think at this rate they should. Over here, got a, another Gunnery Mob Summon going down. Um, balance of Power is ever so slightly in favor of the Lizardmen. And the Salamander hand, Hunting Pack are starting to take some serious damage, so they want to get out of there as quickly as they can. But at the same time, it looks to me like this Necrofex Colossus will be able to pull away and just get Invocation to hecked up. So, Lizardmen, if they have the chance, they, they really should press the advantage here and finish them off, because otherwise, as we so often see, the vampires will just inevitably heal up those single entities. Alright, over here on the right flank, it looks like the scurvy dogs went out for a little bit of scouting action. Uh, maybe discovered it was here and are now pulling back. Obviously, they don't want to fight the leech in a shakwa. Over here, Umbral Tide. Opening fire, doing a lot of damage to the White King, but once again, none of these targets are eliminated as of yet. So, until they're dead, you know, they are still a threat. Wow, that was a really dramatic pause there. I think my brain just went dead for a second. <laughs> uh, Salamander hunting back is... Going to be getting in range again soon, and here it comes, another big volley, overcast invocation to heck, going down on top of everybody, but we'll see, it's probably going to be just enough to help negate the damage that's coming in from them. One thing I do want to point out here is, you know, both players playing it patiently, but I especially like that uh, 
Slayer here has kept his lines very straight and organized as he's been approaching. He's taken a lot of damage, but the, the quickest way to lose a fight like this is to not have an organized approach. So we'll see what happens right now. It does look like a gunnery mob back here are going to begin opening fire. We have some bombs that are hidden. Oh, well, no, they're not hidden anymore. So we'll see if the Lizardmen try to do anything to avoid those. But I'm a bit worried that they're going to be running into a slaughter here when those bombs start unloading on them. Right now, it actually looks like the Lizardmen are going to be thinking twice about closing the gap, pulling back a little bit here. Emerald Tide, opening fire again. There goes another... Oh, more powder on top of the Necrobex Colossus. Oh, a huge shot into the Umbral Tide. The Umbral Tide just getting slaughtered by those cannonballs, just killing so many models as they're tearing through the unit. Over here. <laughs> I do love the fireballs. They belch up. They look wonderful. But right now, Necrofex Colossus still in the game, and it is really just slaughtering what remains of the Umbral Tide, and it's a shame to see because the Umbral Tide are a really powerful unit against this Vampire Coast army that uh, I think the Lizardmen are going to want to try and save for the long run, but there goes another model. They're down to six. So we'll see what happens. Blowing darts, countering lead. Over here, Manticore Summon. I don't know if we've seen any of those as of yet, but the balance of power is continuing to stack in favor of the vampires right now. Looks like Terror's going to be kicking in here from the Necrofex Colossus, if I had to guess. Bombs still thrown away. And yeah, that's just going to shred through Zora's Warriors. Real Manticore going down on top of the Vampire Fleet Admiral. Who just barely summoned, so we'll see what kind of work it gets done. We have Gorok running in here too. And honestly, yeah, Vampire Fleet Captain trying to run away from that right now. Man, that Necrofex Colossus has just been getting so many shots down the flank onto units and that's just causing so much model damage. I'm really curious to see what its value is once this fight is all over. And in the back lines right now, you know, it's just looking like the Lizardman offensive is kind of falling apart a bit here. It's not looking as strong as it once was. They're running out of options. Looks like they still have at least a decent number of Chameleon Skinks left, but Umbral tied down to six models, wavering. They're going to be pulling out, trying to stay safe. Here comes the second Manticore summon, and uh, we'll see if that can change the course of this battle or not. And not to beat a dead horse or harp on it too much, but yeah, this Necrofex Colossus. I, I just feel like there was a lot of switching of target prioritization from Slayer in this match, and maybe if he would have just stayed more consistent on what unit he was trying to take down with the Umbral Tide and the Chameleon Skinks, he might have been able to get one dead, because at this stage in the battle, both White Kings, the Vampire Admiral, and the Necrofex are all still alive. And that's just a, a cry and shame and not a good sign for our Lizardman player as we approach to mid to late game. Kind of looks like the Lizards brought a blow gun to a gunfight. Is that what they're called? A blow... No, a blowpipe. <laughs> they don't know call it a blow gun. But yeah, they brought blowpipes to a gunfight. And, um, you know, as awesome as chameleons are, I just feel like the gunpowder is going to come out on top here. Meanwhile, Gorok over here fighting against the Necrofex Colossus as well as a bunch of Sirenes, otherwise Gorok might have been able to knock out that Necrofex. He's a very tough cookie. <laughs> Bomber's doing some friendly fires. They try to hit Gorok. And the Necrofex Colossus is even going to be like, okay, I, I'm not going to fight you. You're kind of a scary lizard. Gorok must be so frustrated fighting Ghost right now. Alright, Slayer will concede defeat. And even stars gonna take a quick 1-0 lead in this series.
So, Gunnery White's paying for themselves. I mean, they're probably, yeah, they're a bit more expensive than the cost, the value they got back because they did have Scabscrath, but, you know, the Hero Squad did what it needed to do was draw fire and not die because really that's an important thing, and I think that's why with this Vampire Coast Army, one thing I like a lot about it is it does have four single entities that are all pretty tempting targets. It also has two Sirenes, and then you still have all of these bombs and stuff. And the reason I like this is, like, when it comes to Vampire Coast armies, I think a, a sign of a good... We're going to start with our red player this time, who is ODM Slayer, bringing the Beastmen. And I love the Beastmen, and I particularly love the Beastmen against the Greenskins. I think this is a wonderful matchup, so let's see what the players have brought for us. Ungor Spearman Herd with shields. We're going to have four of them. Also going to be looking here at some Gore Herd with the best of Gore Herd in the center. Just looking glorious with their great axes ready to hack away at the Empire. Or... Don't know why I said the Empire. Against the Greenskins. We now have three Ungor Raiders. And then we're going to have a healthy number of Centigors. Looks like we're going to have three of them with throwing axes. And three of them just the regular melee variant. So we'll see how these do in battle. Now to round out this Beastman Force. Do we just have a Hero Squad left? Yeah, it looks like it. Just the Heroes. Not going to have any big monsters or anything like that. Gonna have a Bray Shaman of Wild on a Chariot. Gonna have Jagged Dagger, Trader Kin, as well as Vile Tide. And we're also gonna be seeing Morgor the Shadow Gave. We're gonna be bringing both of his Chaos Spawn summons, as well as Call the Violence. Green Pyre. Not an easy matchup at all, because I don't think Beastmen are an easy faction to play. They're very micro intensive. But, here we are. Savage Orc Biggins. One, two, uh, three. We're going to have two Orc Boys in the center and make that four Savage Orc Biggins. A very popular infantry pick into the green, uh, into the Beastmen because they beat everything. We're going to have Orc Boys and Forest Goblin Spider Riders on the left flank. Night Goblin Fanatics in the back lines here ready to throw some loons out. Got two of them. Orc Boar Boys on the right flank. And then we're also going to have a skirmishing contingent accompanied by some forest goblin spider riders. And we got the deaf creepers and some wolf rider archers. So that rounds out the greenskins force besides leadership. And it does appear we have a river troll hag and grom. Man, I'm getting sick of seeing these two. Uh, we got soul blight, the spirit leech, and overwhelming odor. Because, man, she's stinky. And then over here, we got Grom the Paunch, who's going to have the Axe of Grom, the Great One is here, as well as Language of the Boys. So, it's going to round out our players' armies, and let's go ahead and throw that foliage back on. It makes the game look nicer. So, Beastmen going out into the open field right now, just kind of waiting to see what their opponent has. And on the left flank, you're going to see some Centigors peeling off trying to chase down these greenskin skirmishers. Centigore is looking like they're doing a good job, but they're going to get poisoned. Uh, it's going to make them slower than usual, but it looks like they're still catching a couple of the deaf creepers. And uh, looks like the other one is going to peel off some very nice micro from Slayer there, peeling off and just getting a beautiful counter charge against this other unit of Forest Goblin Spider Riders who were trying to uh, you know, come in for that rear charge and then just sending the other one front front. Also, in turn, good micro from Evenstar here, splitting up these two units so they could surround and potentially shoot them down. But over here, Beastman going to be getting a very nice pickup on the left flank, and I think that's going to be a trade going their way. However, the front line is a different story. Ungor Spearman and Goreherd getting trounced by the Greenskin front line. And uh, now, oh, Best Goreherd too. Yeah, Savage Orc Viggins, even against Best Goreherd, they can do it. Best Gore don't have the best armor. And their armor piercing doesn't mean crap against the Savage Orcs. Over here on the far right flank, though, it looks like the Beastmen are doing a lot better than in the center. So Beastmen doing well on the flanks and folding in the center, which isn't too surprising, actually, given the faction strengths. And uh, over here, the Beastmen are going to be dragging down the Orc Boar Boys. I love Centigors against Orc Boar Boys. And now you even have the Ungor Spearmen going in there to support. Over here, Throwing Axe Centigor is going to be hitting the Orc Boar Boys. Um, we will see what happens from there shortly, but as you can see, Greenskin's crushing through the front line, no problem. Now they're just kind of splitting up, trying to go to the flanks and wrap them up. But um, we'll see what happens. The Beastmen 
still have the balance of power in their favor, and they have a lot of units on the peripheries here that are just very healthy and kind of operating independently, whereas, you know, the Greenskins definitely had the very strong punch in the frontline engagement, but it just, to me, it looks like longevity-wise, the Beastmen may be in a better position as long as they play this smart. Just got to remember that the Greenskins, especially with these regenerating lords and heroes, uh, can cause a lot of problems for the Beastmen. However, there's no terror on the map, so that that's a pretty big deal and neither faction has terror for the other. Ooh, Vile Tide going in hot on top of these Night Goblin Fanatics. Chaos Spawn, the perfect unit to pair with those Vile Tides since they won't take a lot of damage from it, but they're pinning a lot of units in place. Over here, Orc Boar Boys gonna be routing, but the Bray Shaman also getting smashed by the River Troll Hag and by Grom, and I don't know if the Beastmen are gonna be able to get that back. It looks like it's getting caught up on Chaos Spawn. And the River Troll Hag, either a Spirit Leech or another quick hit, should be the end of them. I'm sorry, guys. I feel like I'm very zoomed in, but this is just a very action-packed battle over here. Going to see Forest Goblin Spider Riders getting on top of the Throwing Axes. Green skin starting to mount uh, a bit of a resurgence here. Um, we're going to be seeing Centigors from the other side of the battlefield finally getting over here to help their Beastmen brother in. But man, this is really anyone's game. I can't call this yet. This is just so, so close. Uh, Morgor the Shadow Gabe still doing wonderful things. Looks like the Bray Shaman is gone. Now we have Bestigor and Gore Herd with Centigors on the charge into a bunch of Orc boys. And uh, yeah, that's going to be no contest, especially with Morgor there to support him. All right. Wolf Rider archers are actually chasing Centigors, and now the Centigors are going to turn around and chase them in turn, perhaps. Oh, no, just kidding. They're going the other way. And the Ungor Raiders here in the back line, still plenty of ammunition, and these may come in very, very clutch for the Beastmen in the late game, but look at this. Balance of power is now approaching even. Beastmen still have a slight edge. And right now, it seems we have our, you know, green skin pocket forming. We got our Beastman pocket forming, and uh, yeah, I think Beastmen are really going to have to rely on these arrows and to get as much damage done as possible. Charging into Savage Orc Biggins with the Centigore is really surprising to me. I feel like that was, Beastmen don't need to be, oh, I don't know, yeah, this is a tough one. Because Grom the Paunch and the River Troll Hagger are going to keep on healing up. Uh, I mean, you can say the same for Morgor, but like, he just doesn't have the mobility to really matter in the, those engagements, so we'll see. Because really, other than the hero squad, I think the Beastmen are looking like they're in a better position. Just because they have all these arrows, they can shoot down those Savage Orc Biggins easily enough. Um, they still have some mo uh, mobility here to protect those archers. And if he can get these guys all regrouped, then maybe they'd be in a good spot right now. These throwing axes, this is going to be a key engagement. Can they get out of here? And I just don't know if they can. And now he might be sacrificing everything in a last-ditch effort to save those Centigors. I guess it, he's trading the, the weaker of the two, but yeah, I, those, they, they just need to get back to friendly units. Okay, Grom is chasing them back towards the enemy army, so... That's going to be unfortunate for uh, the Greenskins, since they're kind of routing the opposite of the way they want them to be. Ungor Raider's going to open up on top of Grom, doing some nice damage to him. And there's a big pickup from the Greenskins, and as you can see, the balance of power is now uh, very much in the Greenskins' favor. Over here, it may change, though. These Centigors are going to be coming back. We will see how long they can come back. But, oh no, Orc Biggins coming in to smash the Raiders, and I think we're going to have a GG there. But a very, very strong showing from the Beastmen, especially in the early to mid game. I just don't see how they pull it back from here, but Morgor. <laughs> Morgor's no chump. Spirit Leech on top of the Centigors. Centigors is still getting a lot of value, like fighting to the last. So, power to them. Morgor is still very healthy, but he's about to get surrounded. Here comes some half health Savage Orc Biggins. 
And I just don't know if he can do this by himself. Centacores do great damage to biggins on the charge, but if biggins get counter charts, it's even, which is good for them because Centacores are cheaper. Yeah. Yeah, get up, mule. You're absolutely right. Centacores just have really good offensive stats and weapon strength, so they can really do a lot of damage to the Savage Orc biggins on the charge. And then same thing against just uh, Orc boys and stuff. The perfect vigor, the speed... Advantage. Centigors are some of my favorite units in the game to this day. Um, but, you know, gotta give it to Evenstar. He was able to pull it through. I think, really, the strength of his play there was he, he kept his forces for the most part. He had a consolidated core of forces that, you know, he was operating with. And I think just the mobility of Grom and the River Troll Hag allowed them to react more quickly and support their own allied soldiers in combat better, for instance, than Morgor could, because he's just a bit too slow. And the Bray Shaman got smashed there pretty hard. Um, but Centigore play, on point. All of them doing very well for themselves. Some of them exceedingly well for themselves. I like the Ungor Raider picks there. Maybe ditch one of them and get some more infantry. I don't know. You know, against the green skins, the infantry game is just not going to really be in your favor as the Beastman, so... You might have just been trying to forego that, but in that case, I think in hindsight, maybe get rid of the best core because that, that was a big loss in terms of investing, you know, what, almost 1150 or something or 1050 and only getting 200 gold worth of it. Well, let's go ahead, go back to our blue player who is currently on match point VM Evenstar, starting with the infantry. We are going to have Black Arc Corsairs. Also going to be seeing Bleak Swords, as well as another two Black or Corsairs. These guys have good armor, good melee stats, so good unit overall. Over here we have the almost required Slanesh's Harvesters. We're going to have a generic Black Dragon, so not being ridden by anybody. We'll see what this, this lovely creature does. We're also going to have, for the mobility contingent on the left flank, two Dark Riders, and then we're going to have the same combo over there on the right flank. Up in the air leading this army is Malekith on top of his Black Dragon Seraphim. It's going to be bringing Gates of Malice Stole Stealer, as well as, uh, I want to say Power of Darkness, but I can't remember. It is Power of Darkness, sweet, um, with Spiteful Conjuration for that passive. Let's go take a look at the Greenskins now. We're going to be seeing Gobbles. Got three of them. And then we're going to have Night Goblins. One of which will be the AP Gloonies. We're going to have Orc Boar Boys. Three of them in the back. Two Doom Diver Catapults. Two Savage Orc Biggins. <laughs> A Goblin Great Shaman on top of his Spider. We're going to be seeing Don't Even Try It. Along with Arcane Conduit, Scroll of Leeching, Itchy Nuisance and Vindictive Glare on top of him. And then for the Skirmishing potential, we are going to be seeing Forest Goblin Spider Rider, uh, Archer, and then three Wolf Archers with Mogram's Mangy Marauders being among them. Over here, Vindictive Glare going down. I'm gonna smack into Malekith and Vindictive Glare. You can actually overcast if you're on the Spider mount because, hey, guess what? He, uh, won't get knocked over if he's riding a giant spider. Over here, going to be seeing Savagor Figgins getting a Gaze of Malice, a nasty one at that. Black Dragon taking some damage, but, oh, big breath going down, but a little bit of it going to whiff. And right now, that Black Dragon not enjoying life. Ooh, a big nasty breath from Malekith going into the Night Goblin Fanatics. The eight peak loonies, but I'm not sure if he didn't realize it's eight peak loons or he's just, yeah, he just wants to get a quick in, hit in there. Uh, before his 
infantry gets engaged. Orc boys coming out. We'll see what they decide to do. It looks like they're going to turn and charge into the Black Arc Corsairs. They will do wonderful work against Black Arc Corsairs. Orc boar boys, nice armor piercing, good hit on the charge. And uh, these Black Arc Corsairs may have a hard time dealing with it over here in the center engagements. When he's seen the Goblin Great Shaman, Soul Stealer has popped down on top of him and a lot of these other units. But so far, match looking pretty even. Terror kicking in on top of the Orc Boar Boys. Orc Boar Boys in the back line, getting on top of one of the Dark Riders. And now we're going to have the other one getting charged by Forest Goblin Spider Rider Archers. Loons just devastating these Black Orc Corsairs. Slayer definitely seeming to feel more comfortable with this faction pick. I always remember him being an excellent green skin player. And this other black dragon now is, uh, you know, having a tough time. But the Dark Elves look like they're about to turn. Yep, there they go. They're turning the right flank of the green skin army. And uh, any minute now, they should be able to pivot around. And here comes a dragon breath, and it's going to devastate those Savage Orc Biggins who are doing such an important job holding down this center engagement. But now they are routing very quickly. Goblin Great Shaman is now getting charged by Malekith. Other Black Dragon does look like it may go down, but yeah, right now, you will just, yeah. Hitchy Nuisance is helping the Goblin Great Shaman a lot in this combat, but I think this might be all she wrote as the second dragon comes in, and it looks like we have more Soul Stealers coming down. Yep, there goes the Shatter. Um, sorry, just catching up on the chat, and, uh, yeah, everybody's right on the money with the troll conversation, but looking here, I mean, Malekith, 2400, this Black Dragon got whomped on pretty hard, but, um, the end, it really didn't matter, I mean, the, I thought the green skins, once again, like, all three of these battles, by the way, guys, that's gonna be the fourth 3-0 battle we've cast on this channel from the Warhammer World Cup, um, <laughs> seems to be all I'm getting, um, but yeah, like on the charges and some of those engagements initially, it's like, yeah, Greenskin's doing some very good damage here. Um, especially with the Orc Boys against the Black or Arc Corsairs, but at the end of the day, it just wasn't enough. And I'd have to go back and watch a replay because, I mean, I, I almost think I just didn't have a good handle on what was going on there because I saw that dragon taking the damage and I was like, oh, Greenskin's are actually looking pretty strong this time. Maybe they'll be able to pull this one off and uh, bring it to a round four. But, uh, couple nicely placed dragon breaths some really good soul stealers um which you know <laughs> really good soul stealers uh is uh i mean yeah well placed and uh dark elves able to pull it out with a 3-0 victory there for even star so slayer always a pleasure seeing him here he's a great player and has been in the game for a long time uh been on hiatus for a long time too though and uh hope to see him in tournaments to come even star He's uh, looking like he's in fine form today, and I definitely consider him one of the top contenders for the entire thing when it comes to the Warhammer World Championship. So best of luck to him as he progresses through the brackets.